This morning, uh, we, we, you know, we've been in a series called uh, Go in Power, and uh, we've been going through the book of Acts. And uh, if you're new here, that we like to go verse by verse and, and uh, look at what the Bible says and, and uh, how it applies to our lives. And, and uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've been focused on how God has been changing Peter's perspective uh, on, uh, on who the message of this good news of Jesus uh, was, was for. And uh, Peter had realized that this message wasn't just for Jews, but it was for everyone. And, and that, was, that was a big realization uh, for him and, and for the uh, new Christians at that time. See, the life of a believer in, in Jesus doesn't just end when we make a decision and, and put our trust in, in him. It's, it's a beginning. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at how God wants more for us. And then last week, we were looking at how God has a plan for us. And this morning, I, I want us to close out this section kind of with, with uh, God will come through for us. God will come through for us. For some, for some time now, uh, if you follow politics and like kind of how Aaron was mentioning this morning, you, you can't help but notice that we are a divided country. Society has done a great job in, in convincing people that they should put their trust in the latest fads or, or in progressive ideas that change all the time instead of putting their faith in the word of God. And it's, it's a bit discouraging because it's trickled down into the church. Unfortunately, even the church has become divided over issues that are, that are clear in the Bible. And in Mark chapter 3, verse 25, Scripture says, if a house divided, Jesus says this, if a house divided against itself, that house cannot stand. I like how, how the New Living Translation says it. It says, similarly, similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. See, we need to come together under the word of God. It's extremely important. It's, it's our canon of scripture. It's our rule of law. It's, uh, it has not only lasted the test of time, but it's truth. And it points us to who God is, and it points us to what his plan is for our lives. And from cover to cover, it points to Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said himself, no one can come to the Father except through me, Jesus says. And we, need, you know, we, we tend to focus on, on uh, what God has for us, on, on the spoils of God. You know, we, want, we want a good life. We want good health. We, uh, we want our freedom to choose. But sometimes we don't want to take the commit or make the commitment to know the word of God and to really put God first in our lives. We, we don't want to do that. We want God's blessing, but we don't want to focus on what the word of God says because it'll cost us. There's obstacles that we all face, that will challenge us to either choose to put our trust in God or to put our trust in the world and in ourselves. And we, we need to make those choices because those obstacles are going to come. They're going to come in our lives. And we're going to look here in chapter 12, we're going to see an, an obstacle that the church is going to face. As they're being obedient and telling others about Jesus, there's going to be obstacles. There has been obstacles. We've been looking at obstacles. The, the Sanhedrin, we're, we're trying to shut them down. We're trying to stop the spread of Jesus. There was persecution. We've been looking at that. And here's now an, another obstacle that comes to the church. In, verse, in chapter 12, verse 1, it starts off and it says, About that time... King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. 
So it says, it says about that time, and we kind of think, okay, well, what, what time was that? If you remember last week, we were talking about how, how there was a famine. They had predicted there was going to be a famine that was uh, coming on the land of all the Roman Empire, and that's about that time. There was a famine going on, and, um, and uh, King Herod Agrippa was in power over Jerusalem, Judea, and that whole area during that time. Now, you might say, okay, I've, I've heard of King Herod. Uh, I've heard of King Herod. There, there's more than one King Herod in Scripture. Now, we have this particular guy, King Herod Agrippa I. He is the grandson of King Herod the Great. If you remember King Herod the Great, it was when Jesus was born, he was the one that tried to kill baby Jesus. So this is the grandson of that guy. He's also the nephew of King Herod Antipas. He's the one that had John the Baptist killed. And the one that kind of helped uh, or, or led the way for Jesus to go on the cross. He's the, he's the nephew of this guy. That was his uncle. Talk about being part of a messed up family tree. <laughs> It's amazing. You know? So this is, this is the kind of background that he has. They didn't want Jesus. They didn't like him. So, so a little story on him in, in growing up. As a boy, King Herod Agrippa I, who was actually named Marcus, you know, King Herod Agrippa I kind of sounds a little better, but his name was Marcus. He was sent with his mother to Rome when he was a little boy, and he grew up in the royal family. Without getting into too much detail about his life in Rome, he eventually is made king over Judea, Samaria, and, and the entire kingdom that his grandfather, King Herod the Great, uh, was, was uh, king over. And um, he was kind of a, a, a two-face, I guess, uh, you could say. When he was in Rome, he acted like the Romans. And then when he was in Jerusalem, he followed the traditions of the Jews and, and uh, he kind of acted that way. He even persuaded Emperor Caligula to not carry out that insane plan of putting his statue as a god in the, uh, in the, the uh, Jewish uh, temples. And that, remember we were talking about that, how, how the Jews were real worried about this, how the Jewish leaders were worried that he was going to do that. Well, it's King uh, Herod Agrippa that persuaded him not to do that. He did many things to establish Jerusalem as a political capital in, in the country. He was very interested in having loyal subjects and, and he was very interested in gaining their, their support. And so he would do things to kind of help uh, Jerusalem and, and that area. Uh, his concern for his people and their religions was more practical than it was sincere. It was for practical reasons than it was for sincere. He wanted to gain their love and their loyalty. And so he would do these things. He viewed Christians as divisive. He viewed them as, as uh, their activities as disturbing the people. The Sanhedrin didn't want them, so he didn't want them either. And so that's why he's, he's persecuting them. Okay, that's kind of the mindset that he has. And we pick it up in verse 2 of chapter 12. And it says, He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this blessed the Jews, this pleased the Jews, the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. And this took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned Peter, uh, him, placed him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each, and Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. So get what happens here, okay? He arrests some of the believers. He has James 
uh, one of Jesus' original disciples. Uh, he's the, he's a, one of the sons of thunder. Remember James and John, the sons of thunder? He has him beheaded. Seeing that this pleased the Jewish leaders, that everybody was happy, he then takes Peter. During Passover week, he takes him, imprisons him, and he says, okay, after this week is done, after the celebrations, we're going to go to trial, and then the people are going to love me even more because I'm going to take care of this guy. And, but what he does, he, if you look at what he does, he kind of goes overboard in, in locking him up. He puts him in maximum security. He puts him, he, he has 16 guards controlling this guy, Peter. Okay, it's, uh, it's kind of like um, they, they kind of worked in shifts. So you would have two guards chained to him and two guards outside the cell. And in the overnight time, they would do three-hour shifts. In the daytime, they'd do six-hour shifts. And so he wanted to make sure that he was heavily guarded and, and to make sure that he wouldn't escape. Why, you know, somebody say, why is... That, you know, why did he do that? Well, because Peter has a tendency of escaping from jail. If you remember in, in Acts chapter 5, he's in prison with John, and an angel comes in, and, and the doors open, and, and, uh, and he gets out. And so Herod's like, oh, I'm not taking any chances with this guy. I want the people to love me. I want them to, to worship me, he's thinking. So I'm going to put him in maximum security. So let's look at verse 5. It says, But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed earnestly for him. I love that verse. I want to stop here for a second. Peter is arrested, and he's up for trial. James has already been murdered. He is the first of the 12 disciples that, uh, that will be put to death for proclaiming Jesus. Now Judas... We know that he killed himself. John actually dies of old age. But the rest, they all die by, getting, by being persecuted for, for proclaiming the name of Jesus. And so he's in prison. The church is praying earnestly for Peter. Some of you might be in, in the situation right now that there's a, there's a pressing need that you have in your life, and, and, and you're praying, you're praying earnestly. Maybe it's a loved one who, who needs a, a miracle. Or maybe you're, you're at rock bottom, and, and you need God to intervene in your life, and, and, or, or in someone else's life that you know of, and you're like, God, you've got to do something, because I don't, know, I don't know what to do. I need you. I need you to intervene in my life. And you're earnestly praying. I want to encourage you that God hears your prayers and God will come through for you. He may not answer you the way you want him to answer you, but he hears you and he is working behind the scenes. Peter knew that God was in control. How do we know this? Let's look at verse 6. He says, the night before Peter was placed, was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gates. Peter's sleeping. It says the night before he was placed on trial, he's placed on He's placed in prison during the Passover celebration. It's a week-long celebration. We don't know exactly how long he was in prison. We don't know how long he was locked up, but it could have been almost a week. And, and you might think, okay, you know, okay, the first day, oh, I, God, God got me out last time. He's, he's going to get me out maybe the second day. Yeah. Okay, maybe the third day. No, he's asleep. He's like, God, you're in control how could Peter, Peter be so calm and sleep the night before he could die? I mean, think about it. How do we react when, when something important is going on the next day? And you know, you're tossing and turning in bed, and, and then you get up to go get some chamomile tea if you're into the herbs and that. Or, 
Maybe you get up five times to go to the bathroom and, and you're just you're having a hard time sleeping, you're tossing and turning. I know, I know for me, if, if I've got something really important, that's kind of, you know, my mind's racing. It's not happening with Peter. He's calm. He's got peace. He's asleep. I would suggest to you that Peter wasn't sleeping because of what he knew in his head. Peter slept because there was something he knew in his heart. See, he remembered the boat ride when he was with Jesus and the rest of the disciples. You know, there's a storm. Everybody's freaking out. They're worried. We're, you know, we're going to die here. And where's Jesus? He is asleep soundly. He's, in, you know, I mean, he's, he's having a good time sleeping, relaxing. He remembers that. Peter's not worried. He's not, he's not trying to convince the guards, hey, man, you got to let me out. You, can, you, know, you know what they're going to do to me. He, he's not doing that. He's not giving up. Instead, he's trusting in God's sovereignty. He knows you want God's in control. I mean, what happened to the guy that uh, cut off the priest's servant's ear? You know? What happened to the guy that, that cursed while he was denying Jesus because he feared for his life? What happened to that guy? Something changed in his heart. He now knew he had peace. God's in control. God's got this. Your life up to this point may not have gone the way you preferred or you may be in a situation that you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And it's scary, it's lonely, it's frustrating. I, I get it. Prophet Isaiah tells us that God will keep in perfect peace all who trust him. All whose thoughts are fixed on him. God will keep in perfect peace. When we keep our eyes on God and not on our situation, his peace will be on us. Peter's asleep because he knew God was in control. When we put our trust in him, God will come through for us. God will intervene in our lives. He will intervene in our lives. Let's, let's take a look at uh, verse 7. Suddenly, there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on his side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up, and the chains fell off his wrists. God intervenes here. Okay? God sends an angel to rescue Peter. And I, I chuckle a little bit because he wasn't stealth. You know, he... He wasn't, it wasn't that, that scene, you know, you see in the movies where somebody's in the background, he's got the hood, and he's coming over, and he's like, hey, let's, let's go. Come on, let's go. Let's get out of here. You know, and it's all quiet. Let's, we, can, we can get you out of here. It wasn't that. I mean, look, it's a bright light show. You know, kicks him in his side. Get up. <laughs> Yells at him. Quick, get up. I mean, it's like... It, you know, he, he comes and he's like, we got to go. And it's like, you, you look at this scene, you're like, well, um, in chapter 16, we know that Luke, the guy who wrote, writes this, is traveling with some of the apostles. So he must have heard the story from the apostles. He must have heard it from either Peter or Paul or one of these guys that had heard it directly from what had happened. And I can just, I can just imagine the story being told. You know, Peter's like, Man, I'm sound asleep. I know God had it. He kicks me. He wakes me up. He's yelling at me. I don't, you know. God intervenes in our life, and when he intervenes there, you know, we'll know it. And I love it. Peter asks no questions. He he gets up, the chains fall off. He doesn't ask any questions. And that's not like Peter. I mean, <laughs> he asks questions. He lets his point known. You know, he's always, every time Jesus is like, you know, hey guys, uh, I'm going to be leaving you. He's like, no, uh, we're going with you. You know, no, you can't. You know, he's always, he's always got the opposition, the voice of opposition, Peter. He's like, no, he's, he's quiet, asks no questions. He's obeying. 
Peter has grown in trusting God, in trusting that God is faithful to guide him. God will guide us. He will come through for us. God will guide us. Here's another thing, step by step. He's not going to lead you astray. I want you to take a look at at verse 8 here. It says, Then the angel told him, Get dressed, put on your sandals, and he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. Look, God takes care of our physical needs. He didn't just grab him, you know, right there in his underwear. Hey, come on, let's go, let's get out of here. Here Uh, Was that too much? (laughs) Say, get dressed. Put on your clothes. Come on, let's let's take care of your physical needs. One by one. In Psalm 37, it, it tells us, David tells us, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their life. Though they stumble, they will never fall. For the Lord holds them by the hand. God will come through for you. You just need to do the next thing that he's asking. It's step by step. We don't need to know the whole path. Can be really frustrating because I like maps. I like looking at the big picture. You know, when, when I'm, I'm driving uh, UPS, uh, we have the option to either uh, do turn by turn or look at the entire map and see all the deliveries. And I like to look at that and I like to pick where I go. You know, I like to look at the, the entire big picture and, and then I'll decide on what I, I take, what road I take. When, when Christy and I are going somewhere and, and it's a place that I don't know and I'll pull up the map in, on my phone and and of course, I want to see the map. I want to see where the destination is. Yeah, you know, they'll give me a suggestion, but I kind of, if I see a better way, I'd like to take it because I'd like to know exactly the whole big picture. Christy's more of a turn by turn. And she, doesn't, and she doesn't want me to be looking at my phone, obviously, because I'm driving. So she's like, I'll give you directions. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Guys, you know, you know what that yeah. And so what happens? No, <laughs> get lost. no, we don't. She's very good. But this is what happens. She'll say, okay, at the end of the road, turn left. And then she'll put the phone down. <laughs> okay, so what about, what, where do we go after that? I'll, I'll let you know after we just turn left. Right now. <laughs> no, but where are we going? Uh, what's the, you know, I wanna, and that's frustrating, I know. But, but here God, God's step by step. Do this now. God, I guess God is a turn by turn guy, right? <laughs> I mean, Again, I don't know if that's biblical or not, but uh, God wants to. You know, she's she's she show, she's show, yeah she's showing me uh, uh, the way Jesus is. Absolutely, she's representing Jesus to me. God wants us to let Him direct our steps, and He will come through for us. Peter. Peter's only responsibility through, the, through this whole great escape was to get dressed and follow. Follow the angel. Sometimes we, uh, we make things so complicated that at the end, that we, we, we end up following, uh, not following what God wants because we get in our own way. You know, he wants us to follow him step by step. What do you, you know, this next day, what, what do you have for me? To seek him, what do, what do you have for me today? Because it, a lot of times he doesn't give us the big picture because we'll go, oh, okay, yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing in 10 years. Now I'm going to shoot for that. And I'm going to miss all these other things. So it continues here in verse 9 in chapter 12. It says, So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed the first and second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. And so they passed through and started walking down the street and then the angel suddenly left him. It's amazing, huh? 
Look at this. Scripture doesn't tell us whether the guards were, were sleeping or if they were awake. A lot of people think that they were sleeping because Peter was sleeping. It was nighttime. Uh, but Scripture doesn't say that. And many commentators believe that, that during this great escape, Peter and the angel became invisible or transparent as they pass through the first and the second guard posts. Sometimes God will not allow us to avoid or go around or even knock out our opposition. He just simply takes you through it. When we're close to him, he takes us through it. And look at this. When they get to the gate... God opens it for them. God opens it for them. Sometimes we have to get to the gate in order for God to open it for us. You know, we'd like to stop and say, okay, God, open the door and let me sit here until that door is open and then I'll go. God doesn't always work like that. It'd be nice because, you know, you can see the whole future and say, okay, it's, everything's going to be good. I don't have to put faith or trust in this. I can just go. We'd love that. But that's not how God works. We have to get to the gate and then he opens it for us. And again, that's a step by step. And look at this. So they passed through and started walking down the street and then the angel suddenly left him. The angel leaves after they pass through the gate because what God had planned for that great escape, for that intervention, was to get him to that place. And then there comes a point where a choice has to be made. Peter's got to make a choice now. Choice of acceptance is on us. The choice of acceptance is on us. Look what it says in, in verse 11. It says, Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said, the Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from the Jewish leaders and planned and leaders uh, from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. I mean, this is, this is a realization that he had after the angel left. Okay, sometimes it's hard that as we're going through a tough time, it's hard to see that God is working in our life. It's hard to see that, that we, are, we are in God's plan, that, that his hand is in our lives because we're going through a hard time. We're, 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 the only thing we can see is, is the mess that, that is happening around us. And we don't see it until we've been set free from it. And then we look back and we see that God had orchestrated everything. He had orchestrated this rescue plan for me. We'll talk a little bit more on this in a little bit about God's rescue plan. Look at verse 12. It says, When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. And having, having been saved and rescued from his prison, he had a choice to make. Okay, he's outside the gate. What do I do? Do I... Okay, finally, I'm so free. I know these guys are going to come after me. I'm going to go and hide. I'm going to go and I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to take off. You know, I'm, he could have done that. But no, he decided, I'm going to go where the church is praying. I'm going to go where, where I know people love God and I know God is there. I'm going to go there. He goes where God leads him. See, this is a key decision point that I want to bring up this morning because a lot of times after a blessing from God, when we're feeling on top of the world, the enemy likes to come in and tempt us and knock us down and discourage us and make us feel like the good thing that happened was because of me or because of just those around us. And, and we take our eyes off of the fact that God is the one that rescued us. God's orchestrating it all. We need to turn to him. We need to look to him even after that blessing. We need to continue to keep our eyes focused on him. He makes his decision to go where the church was. 
And guess what they were doing? They were praying. They were still praying. Church has been praying this whole time for him. Look at look what happens when he gets to the praying church. Verse 13. He says, He knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back and told everyone, Peter's standing at the door. Now, now at this point, you would think that the church would be, would be uh, hopefully very happy. I mean, they've been, they've been praying for days, faithfully. You'd hope that they'd be excited to hear, Peter's at the door. Awesome. God answered our prayers. That's great. Well, what did they say? You are out of your mind. <laughs> they said to the girl. They, when she insisted, they decided, oh, it must be an angel. I mean, listen, I, I, I don't want to be critical. <laughs> All these days of praying, what are you praying for? <laughs> I mean, were they praying that God would let them go quickly without pain? Were, were they praying that at, at, the, at the trial that uh, that there would be a, a, a rescue there or something. What exactly were they praying earnestly for, for this whole week that they've been praying? They said it must have been an angel. Sometimes it's easy. It's easier. It was easier for them to believe that Peter had already died and that this angel was coming to let them know of the news than it was to believe that God rescued Peter. They got freedom. Sometimes it's easier for us to believe when we are in a situation that there's no way out than it is to believe that God will come through for us. And maybe we chalk it up to experience. Well, I can't imagine how my relationship with so-and-so can ever be restored. I mean, it's, it hasn't happened yet. I can't imagine how, how things could ever turn around in my finances. I mean, we've been trying. It's never happened yet. I can't imagine how I could ever overcome this sickness or this disease. It hasn't happened yet. I can't, I can't imagine. I find it ironic that when God answered the prayer, the church's prayer, they said, you're, you're out of your mind. I think back of Jesus saying, why do you have so little faith when he asks his disciples after saying that is, is why he tells them not to worry about everyday life. He tells them whether, whether you have enough food to eat or clothes to wear. He tells them, why do you have such little faith? So finally, they open the door and they, and they saw him and then they're amazed. God came through for Peter and for the church. He answered their prayer. God has intervened in what was a death sentence for Peter. He was in custody of a, of a tyrant king who wanted to be accepted by the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders wanted Jesus' followers to be silenced, to be put to death, to be stopped. God had a rescue plan in place for Peter. Let me tell you this. God also had a rescue plan in place for James. You say, well, hold on, I, I thought James was killed. James completed his work on earth and he got to be with Jesus before the others. That tells me God had a, God had a rescue plan for James. James. He's in paradise. He's having a great time. It wasn't Peter's time yet. God still had more for Peter to do. So Peter's going to have to wait a little bit longer. As the musicians come up this morning, the rescue plan, the greatest rescue plan that God has orchestrated is the one that rescues us out of a separation from him out of a literal hell. 
That's the greatest rescue plan. And none of us can stand in the presence of God based on our own actions. See, because just one sin is enough to completely separate us from a pure and holy God. And that's why in the rescue plan, he sent Jesus to live on earth a sinless life, a completely pure life. so that he made it able to stand before God. And then he credited that life, that pure life, to everyone else. As long as they, one, put their faith in him, they ask him to forgive us of our sins, and we put our faith and trust in him. Then what Jesus did is credited to us. And then we can stand before God, not because we are good and we are uh, sinless and all that, but because Jesus' sinless life uh, paid for it. We can cash it in. And I'll just ask, will, will you do that this morning if you haven't? Or maybe you're going through a difficult season in your life. And it's hard to trust that God will come through for you. Maybe you've given up asking. Maybe you've decided to take matters into your own hands. I want to encourage you this morning to place your trust in Jesus. Put it in Jesus. He has a rescue plan in place. And all he needs from us is to obey and to follow him. Like Peter. You have to follow him. Step by step. So I'd like to ask you, if you'd like to make a commitment and would like someone to pray for you as we stand and sing this morning, I would invite you to come up front. We'd love to pray with you. There'll be people up here to pray with you. But let's stand. Hey, this is Pastor Paul. I just wanted to take a moment and personally thank you for being a part of our service this morning. If something in this message touched you or you decided to commit your life to Jesus and you want to know more about furthering your relationship with him, please reach out to me. Send me an email. I know that these are tough times and we could all use some encouragement. And one of those ways is to worship live together. Uh, If you live in the Grey New Gloucester, Maine area, we'd love for you to join us on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. And if you're not in this area and you don't currently have a church, I would encourage you to reach out to a church near you, a Bible preaching church. Make sure it is very important where you'll be encouraged and strengthened in your walk with Jesus. Hey, listen, Jesus loves you. We love you. Have a wonderful day.